Commander Rick calling Earth. Come in, you surface dwellers, you prisoners of gravity. Is anyone listening Please to me out there? Please remain calm. Do I not panic. Help. Stay inside your homes, at least fish. till the show's over, okay? And please don't adjust your set, because this is as good as it gets. I used to be an Earthling, just like you. Well, maybe a little better than you. But I could see the world was going to hell in a handbasket, so I decided to take off. Go out and uh, explore strange new worlds and civilizations. You know, boldly go where no man has gone before. And now I'm stuck inside some communication satellite. All I can get is about 4,000 TV channels up here. I got a converter the size of a suitcase over there. Luckily, there's no gravity. Well, since I'm up here and I've got nothing to do, I've decided I'm going to save the Earth. Well, it's either that or watch 46 reruns of MASH at the same time. If we're going to save Earth, that means we've got to start talking about the issues, and that means science fiction and comic books, because no one else is talking about the issues. Here's a graphic novel by jean Giraud Mobius, French artist, The Silver Surfer. It's all about cults, about the issues. Now, if this story were told as a novel, it would get respect. It would be a book. It would be reviewed as a book. If these pictures were hanging in an art gallery, they'd call them art. In fact, those pictures have hung in art galleries. His work's hung in galleries all over the world. It is art. But take the pictures and put them with the words, and everyone goes, oh, well, it's just a comic book. Just a comic book? Yeah. Science fiction is dealing with the issues. For the aliens from the movie The Abyss. That was created by computer animation. It's just an electronic image. Well, I should talk. Oh, isn't this weird? This is probably what I look like too, a pseudopod. The pseudopods were created right here in Canada. Well, not here in Canada, right down where you are in Canada. And water is the hardest kind of computer animation to do because it shimmers, it reflects, and it never stops moving. But Alias Research Incorporated, the company that did it, has come up with some very complicated computer software to create the effect. science fiction. In fact, Ronald Reagan, when he was still president, once told Mikhail Gorbachev of the USSR that it was too bad the world wasn't facing some alien threat because then all the peoples of the earth would pull together and unite against the common threat. Great attitude, eh? Gee, if only there was someone we could hate more than you. <laughs> we could all hate them together. <laughs> then we'd be friends because we'd hate someone together. It's like straight out of a 1950s science fiction film. The 13th and final chapter, Rocketing to Earth. When Ming ordered the Earth people seized and Baron and Aura defied him, the crafty Ming changed his tactics and declared the Earth people free to return to Earth. Flash and Dale hurried to Zarkov with the good news, but found him dejected beside his wrecked invisibility machine. Not trusting Ming, Bolton invited the Earth people to his sky city, and Baron offered to take them in his rocket ship. Spies reported this to Ming, and when Flash and his friends, including Aura, hurried to meet Baron at the agreed place, a rocket ship circling low. Mars, the god of war. Is there life on Mars? Is there life in here? Here's an article from the Star newspaper on UFOs. Apparently, they've already landed in England, knocked everyone out, and left. Check your wallets. Gordon and his friends. You murder. Put him in the dungeon. Oh, boy, that was a lucky one. Yeah. You heard, Bobby? Yes, yes, sir. 
We must get him out of here at once. The Thing was my favorite invasion of Earth story from the 1950s. Imagine it. James Arness from Gunsmoke dressed as a six-foot vegetable. It played on everybody's fear of the invading Russian hordes and, of course, of eating all their vegetables for dinner. When John Carpenter remade the film in 1980, he had to update the story, and he actually went back closer to the original story by John Campbell. In the new version, the thing assumed people's identities, lived inside of them, and then when it was discovered, it kind of panicked and lost control of itself, kind of like I'm doing here. Lost control of itself, and then it would suddenly explode outwards in this horrible mess. Now think about it. Losing your identity, hiding, it's the perfect metaphor for the yuppies in the 1980s. This is too weird. What's going on here? The Thing, the new picture, really isn't a remake of the old movie. It's a sequel to the old movie. And let me explain. Um, the original movie was taken from a book called Who Goes There? And um, originally, uh, Howard Hawks did the first part of the book, but he couldn't figure out how to do the last part. So he stopped right after the alien comes down crash lands, you know, tears up the whole camp, and then they destroy it. And what they don't realize, and this is the premise of the second one, that even if a small piece of the monster has touched you or gotten on you, that it can duplicate you and become you and just hide, you know, and then you disappear, and it, it imitates. What we do in the thing, you actually see uh, mechanical effects. Uh, what we do is we'll create the creature or, or a person from the anatomy up, we'll, we'll do an, an under skull and there'll be like uh, cables and levers to supplement muscles and stuff and then we'll put a makeup skin over it and it'll become that person that can act w in a sequence with the other actors. Then we start pushing buttons, pulling cables, uh, throwing air through it and doing all this stuff and it starts changing and then it'll turn inside out and another creature will come out and then he'll start growing and changing and then it'll split and it keeps moving like that. This is one out of the 35 to 40 different changes and <clears throat> what happens is the, the thing is basically like a murder mystery um, and uh, Kurt Russell, the hero, in, in the uh, beginning of the film stumbles upon another camp in the Antarctic and he goes inside and there's men that have committed suicide and they don't really understand why and as they piece together the clues they go into another room and find this. Obviously it has very human features but something is definitely wrong with it so they take it back to the American camp to do an autopsy on it but what they don't realize is they've infected the entire camp by bringing the creature in. Oh. So the creature then becomes one of the men, two of the men, but we really don't know. And the mystery is for the audience to solve. Is, that, is it me or is it just getting a little stuffy in here? Sorry, where was I? Alien invaders, right. Speaking of alien invaders in air, remember War of the Worlds? The aliens were defeated by airborne bugs, germs. They caught a cold and they died. I don't know why I thought of that, but there you go. A lot of the best alien stories, the ones that live on and are truly great, are not about aliens. The important thing they're saying is about people. Alien stories are about people. Feels trapped in a tiny bubble of air. I only have a limited supply of oxygen up here, and water, and food. Actually, so do you down on Earth. The difference is I realize it. Our Earth began as a motley collection of meteorites zooming through space. Every few million years, there'd be collisions, and the space fragments would absorb one another through gravitational pull. When one ball grew big enough, its gravity became like the power of a cosmic vacuum cleaner. It swept other fragments into its growing mass and absorbed them. Time for some comic talk. DC Comics has a new Batman series called The Cult, it was written by Jim Starwin and drawn by R Bernie Wrightson, who drew the first 10 issues of Swamp Thing, so you know it's going to be good. It's a, a dark, gothic story about Batman battling a twisted evangelist. See? That's the issues. As well, Dark Horse Comics is staging a battle between two rather nasty aliens. It's the Predator versus the alien, sort of like Adolf Hitler meets Genghis Khan. The Predator, who came to Earth to hunt humans for sport, is a very high-tech kind of guy from, obviously, a very high-tech advanced civilization. The alien, on the other hand, is completely primitive. No cutlery for this guy. He's like the intergalactic shark, a feeding machine designed to survive anywhere. And it gets worse, my friends. Look at the comics that might be coming out as movies. The Destroyer, Nick Fury, and The Punisher.
Oh, yeah, by the way, The Punisher has a new graphic novel, cover-to-cover -cover action, or, as they would say, violence. When his family's killed by these criminals, he uses the skills he acquired in Vietnam to wreak havoc on the bad guys. Created by Steve Grant, Mike Zeck, and John Beatty. Kool-Aid. That's oxygenated liquid fluorocarbon designed to protect his lungs from collapsing when he reaches the bottom of the abyss. Human lungs are just not designed for that kind of a depth. In a way, he's actually invading the alien space and their environment. Oxygenated liquid fluorocarbon. Science fiction, right? <coughs> Wrong. Never mind air. I need companionship up here. Swamp Thing gets Heather Locklear. Batman gets Kim Bassinger. King Kong got Fay Ray. Have you noticed? Only the weird, goofy-looking guys get the women. Hey! They're easy. And did you see the green one? That's Jim Carrey. He's Canadian. Well, okay, not in the movie. In the movie, he's from outer space. But I don't get it. Fuzzballs in primary colors, and they get women. That's unbelievable. I'm losing you. I'm losing you. They're cutting me off. I'm losing you. We've got to talk about is good versus evil. Now, in what I call the simple or old-fashioned view, good and evil were very easy to tell apart. The good guys, the heroes, were handsome, brave, and strong, da-da-da-da-da, you know, like Prince Charming and Superman, whereas the villains were ugly, they lisped and, and drooled and breathed funny and strange, things like that. If they were evil women, they were beautiful, but they usually had long black hair, whereas the good women, the heroines, all had blonde hair, like Dale Arden and Flash Gordon. Of all the other pictures done at, MG, at uh, Universal that year, Outside of the one Deanna Durbin, the serial, the Flash Gordon serial, was the second big moneymaker at the studio. The 13th and final chapter, rocketing to Earth. Why should Prince Darren do that? I don't know. I can't understand. Circling from back. Quick, get out of the Now there's Buster Crabbe, he played Flash Gordon in the 1930s. Anyway, the simple view of good versus evil is still around. Heck, in some countries, it's still official foreign policy. Take James Bond, for example, the new movie, License to Kill. The hero looks good, the bad guy looks ugly, and the women look great. myself when I'm writing and I want to do something I say to myself would Ian approve I try to think because there is no doubt in my mind that the success of the bonds is basically the uh, caused by the James Bond syndrome even though I'm calling it the 60s view of good versus evil the idea that the monster can be the hero has been around for as long as Frankenstein the hunchback of Notre Dame it was around even long before that and it's been around as recently as the swamp thing in the Swamp Thing comic books by Alan Moore, the villain is Anton Arcane, who creates these monstrosities, these biological monsters called Animum, and then unleashes them. And British horror writer and director Clive Barker wrote, In what other comic book would I find a monster capable of such radical philosophies or embodiments of evil as genuinely chilling as anything I'd seen on screen or printed page or rhyming demons or love between a plant and a lady? I ask you, once addicted, where else could I go for a high like that? Now, in the movie, The Swamp Thing, or the new one, Return of the Swamp Thing, it's all a lot more, it's kind of, they made it sort of goofy. 
The big green guy is back. They call me Swamp Thing. You're a plant, aren't you? He's come back to settle the score. Find him and bring him in. He's got a grudge, cause they turned him to slud. I believe this is yours. What? The return of Swamp Thing. Starring Louis Jordan. What did you do? Sell your soul to the devil? Let's just say he has a lease uh, with an option to buy. Heather Locklear. She can get in my jeans anytime she wants to. Why can't men be more like plants? I mean, you can stroke a plant and it doesn't get the wrong idea. And swamp thing. But I can't give you the kind of love you want. Why not? I'm a plant. That's okay. I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> Turn of Swamp Thing. He's turning over a new leaf for love. What's this? The evening news? No, that has to be Clive Barker. Ugh, the facelift from hell. That's the Hellraiser comics. Clive Barker is Britain's answer to Stephen King, if anyone was asking. He wrote the novels Hellraiser and Cabal, and he's directed both of them as movies. Now here, in Clive's work, the bad guys wear the pinstripe suits and the monsters are the heroes. The 60s view, but ooh, strong stuff. Not for comic book fans raised on Richie Rich. Ooh. Oh boy, I'm glad Clive didn't do the opening of this show. I'd be roasting on a spit by now. The 60s view of Good and Evil that said the monsters were the heroes was the exact opposite of the simple view where the heroes were good looking and strong and brave, but they were both just as naive. A more sophisticated view of good and evil is what I call the ironic view. Irony is when something turns out the exact opposite of what you'd expected, like, say, uh, a guy takes off from the planet Earth because he thinks it's corrupt and decadent. He wants to go out and start brave new worlds and civilizations, and instead he ends up stuck on a satellite and all he can see are TV signals. Irony. Now, the ironic view of good and evil says that they are opposite sides of the same coin. They exist together. In fact, they bring each other out. You can't have one without the other. And that's the theme of Batman the movie. Let's be. I have a little whip of my policy. his toys from any store in the entire world. Heck, I'm up in space and I still can't get away from all the Batman paraphernalia there is. It's unbelievable. Batman mugs, Batman hats, Batman underwear, Batman rugs, believe it or not, Batman keychains. Look at all this stuff. Batman paraphernalia is selling in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Hunter, the movie has single-handedly saved the economies of South Korea and Hong Kong. Look at this thing. This is great. This is a Joker doll. It's like a wedding Betty doll. And look at this, the Bat Watch. Same Bat time, new Bat price. Everything Batman, and this is nothing. Sales of Star Wars paraphernalia have topped $160 billion. That's right, billion. $160 billion worth of Star Wars toys and gimmicks. $160 billion is enough to money to buy the space shuttle program six times over. Speaking of the Joker, there's a great new collection out. The greatest Joker stories ever told. Comic books from the 30s to modern times. Great read. And then there's another comic written by Alan Moore again called The Killing Joke. Now this is a state-of-the-art comic book. This thing has won every award there is. And it's definitely not for children.
Well, again, it all depends on the character. If I'm if I'm doing a Batman story, which I'll be doing soon, uh, I'm certain that I'm going to have the editor call me up after a couple of days when he sees my script and goes, "You can't kill Commissioner Gordon. He's a popular character." Um, so they do restrict you a little bit. When I'm writing my own stuff, I have absolutely no restrictions, and I often use that freedom to do extremely strange things. Well, why should we? Why should we take comics seriously? I, I don't understand. I mean, comics are just... I mean, you know, comic books are like... The first time you're introduced to a comic book is when you buy bubblegum, right? Mm -hmm. You open up the wrapper and there's a little comic in there. And, you know, you outgrow chewing bubblegum and you move into the hardest stuff, like milkshakes. And you forget about comics. And I think that's what... Some people don't outgrow the bubblegum. And almost forget about the I think comic I think comics are bubblegum for the mind. Some people don't outgrow the bubblegum. But bubblegum is important. Bubblegum is important. Because you can inflate it to the size of your head and have it pop on you. Um, comic books have always been uh, described as cheesy. I'm your set of baby. I only want to love me. I'm a mommy's mood. Because even set of ever got a rat that I flew. Batman. The movie has nothing to do with the comic book. I mean, the Joker in the film is responsible for Batman's death, but in the comic book, he isn't. And it kind of fools around with the myth of Batman. I'm not so sure I like that. But it did remind me of Beirut or Chicago in the 30s. So I like the visual aspects of the movie. What I've been trying to do recently um, is to take the stuff of the old comics and do it in a way that it'll, that, that, that's worth reading for me. A fastest man alive. What is it insisted that every man had He's the White House, isn't it, dear? Whatever stories I write have to do with my reactions to what's going on around me, with the world that I live in right now, with 1980s America, which is a very frightening, silly um, place. And it's often silly and frightening at the same time, and I hope Dark Knight is often silly and frightening. <laughs> This is Commander Rick calling Earth. Come in, you surface dwellers, you prisoners of gravity. I want to talk to you about what's wrong with I want to talk to you about what's I want to talk to you about what's wrong with the world. Hey, hey, you guys. Excuse me, I I answered the phone out. She takes him to the door. Excuse me. Has him five dollars, see? Pay. Hey, hey, you guys. He says, I Hey, shut up! Hey! Look, this could be very important. Does anyone here have a son in a missile silo? Missile silo? Yeah, North Dakota? Chip? Look, I, I know how this sounds, but... Well, I answered the phone out there, and, and the guy on the other end, he was very, very frantic. He, he thought I was his dad for a minute. I, I think he just had the wrong area code. Yes, but, so what? Well, so he was calling from a missile silo. He said that they were locked in, 50 minutes and counting, to shoot off their nuclear wad. We would be getting it back in an hour and ten. I mean, he meant that we're at war. Nuclear war. This is a tape. What would you do if you got a phone call telling you the end of the world was coming? Reverse the charges. Actually, if there is a nuclear war, the only phone that's going to be ringing is the hotline that runs from the Kremlin to the White House. And the hotline isn't even a phone. It's a series of telegraph and radio circuits that go from Washington to London, Copenhagen, Stockholm, through Helsinki, and then finally to the Kremlin. It was set up way back in 1963 at the height of the Cold War, right after the Bay of Pigs fiasco and the Cuban Missile Crisis. They figured, you know, if there's ever a global crisis, the Americans and the Russians are going to want to get that long-distance feeling. But the Cold War is over now, right? 
Yeah, we have glasnost now. Well, we don't have glasnost. The Russians have glasnost. Glasnost, Russian for openness. Detente, French for dialogue. Disarmament, American for pinko commie Democrats. I feel like I'm talking to myself up here sometimes. Uh, the Cold War mindset, it's still there. The other day, I lock into a signal coming from the Geneva Arms Talks, and the reporter says, with this treaty, the United States and the Soviet Union move closer to peace. Peace. I'm sorry, when did they declare war? Did I miss something? I'm scanning 4,000 TV signals up here. I didn't see anyone declare war. The mindset is there. Ronnie Reagan thought the world was going to end in a flash. Ronnie Reagan was president of the United States from 80 to 88. You know, commander-in-chief of the world's most powerful armed forces. You might have seen him as the star of Hellcats of the Navy. AIDS had been around for about five years, and Ronnie finally asked what it was. When his, his physician explained what it was to him, Ronnie said, Ooh, gee, I always thought the world might end in a flash, but this sounds like it could be worse. It is worse. If only Ronnie had read comic books. Look at this. These are public service comic books, public health comic books from around the world. They are dealing with AIDS. They are dealing with AIDS explicitly. And they're in comic book form because young people trust comic books. Comic books talk about the issues. If Ronnie Reagan thinks the world's going to end in a flash, he's going to love the movie Miracle Mile. Listen, you said you were going to go get Julie. I'm lying. Obviously, Miracle Mile is not the first film about nuclear war, but it is the first one in a while. Nuclear war is kind of passe, you know, old-fashioned. I mean, now we've got the greenhouse effect, the ozone layer, toxic waste, nuclear waste, all sorts of cool stuff like that. In a uh, survey done for a TVO program, the majority of the people said they didn't think there would be a nuclear war in their lifetime. Wrong! We've already had a nuclear war. World War II was a nuclear war. It was won by nuclear weapons, remember? Oh, wow, I thought Nagasaki was a kind of stereo, man. <clears throat> During a series of meetings in Potsdam, Germany, the final doom of Japan is settled by the Big Three and their advisors, delivering an ultimatum of unconditional surrender to the Nipponese warlords. The Japanese suffers the consequences. Swarms of B-29s and carrier task forces carry destruction to the Japanese homeland. These and the following scenes of the opening of the final assault on Japan were photographed by newsreel, Navy, and Signal Corps cameramen. In the 1950s, everyone was terrified of radiation. R-A-D, I-A-T, I-O-N. Yes, it was nice in the war, really. The shelters, the blackout, cups of tea. The ARP, the evacuees. London kids seeing cows for the first time. Old Churchill on the wireless. The nine o'clock news. Vera Lynn singing away. Spitfires and arrogance and the blue sky over the cornfield. Those were the days. In On the Beach by Neville Shute, nuclear war has devastated everywhere except Australia. Now radiation is coming to cook everyone's shrimp on the barbie.